How's it going? Um, welcome to the shape of punk to come. Uh, talk in three parts, beginning with part one. Who is this guy? Um, hi, my name is Ben Rausch. Um, I, by day, run an animation and design studio called Cool Your Jets with one of my best friends, Matt McFarland. He's sitting right there. Um, so my daytime titles would be animator, illustrator, director, designer, and editor. And because I'm a really big fan of spreading myself way too thin, I have added to that list in the night times and weekends, VJ, DJ, event designer, promoter, blogger, record level boss, and dancing enthusiast. <laughs> Most recently, I've also added to that list comic book creator and game developer. Uh, in comic book making, I do a comic called Red Air with my friend Naz Hussin. He writes it, I draw it. Um, it's about music, uh, it's a kind of like psychedelic sci-fi slasher comic. Uh, third issue is releasing this weekend in Cape Town at the Books Festival. Um, on the game side, I am one third of Team Laserbeam. Um, we're a group of friends who started working on a game at a maze together last year along with Matt. Uh, we kind of like kept at working on game together whenever we have any free time. Um, you can play some of them upstairs, there's like a little machine with three of them. They're kind of cute and weird, and that's the kind of thing we like. And I'm also one third of the, well part of Super French Parquet, which is a much bigger collective, started by Richard as well from Team Laser Beam and Peter Carvel Gardner. He's also a swell guy and a whole amazing group of friends who we kind of build things, make things, try to present video games in new, exciting, inclusive ways. If that sounds like your kind of thing, you should totally swing by our party tonight at the Collision Park Gallery. You'll all get a free with your own bands. Um, so that's who I am. Oh, wait, no, no, there's more, there's more. It's not the end. Pretty much all of the stuff that I've done has kind of like orbited around music. Even though a lot of what I do is very visual or based around events or words, it's mostly like music is the center of my little universe. But what I want to try to do is translate the feeling that I get from music, the impact that rock and roll music has on me, and translate that into other mediums. So um, that's resulted in me making lots of weird stuff that confuses the hell out of people. But I think most successfully, I've kind of come up with a new way of doing visuals where I use a guitar and trigger animations of that through wireless stuff into a guitar pedal, back up through a projector and stuff. Um, I played with a bunch of different bands. Um, I don't know if you can see, there's me having the time of my life. And a lot of people going like, I can't hear his guitar. Why don't they turn up the guitar? Um, so, part two, punk. Or rather, punk. What am I talking about when I talk about punk? Am I talking about kids in the 70s with leather jackets and safety pins through their noses? Or am I talking about kids in the 80s running record labels from their mom's basement? Or am I talking about girls in the 90s photocopying their own zines? I'm talking about all of those things, but I'm talking about something that stretches a lot further back than that. Uh, this pre precedes punk, predates punk, and it predates rock and roll. It's part of our human spirit. I think it's like something that's like in all people, this like desire to kind of like keep pushing things forward, to keep challenging stuff to make culture better through like making shit that initially really rocks the boat. Um, so, like, yeah, I think that this is, this is part of our essence as all people, but it kind of lies latent in most of us. So, to get it to come up, we need this like perfect combination of elements that'll kind of foster and, um, you know, incubate this kind of spirit. So, you can see I've got this cool little Captain Panic guy, and in proper Captain Panic fashion, like what like little power rings does he need to come to life, right? So, ching ching ching. First, we need vibrant new technologies. Part of rock and roll has always been about the fact that it, it like harnesses something new and exciting that's going on. That's able to help with the sense of pushing things forward. Um, whether that's like the guitar or the printing press, like we have this long history of people taking these new technologies and kind of using them to completely turn shit on its head. Um, then next up, we have close-knit communities. Uh, I think it's super, super important and totally vital that people have people that they can share their experiences with. Even if the rest of the world thinks that what they're doing is totally shitty, pointless, stupid, at least having a few friends that go like, dude, this is totally awesome, you should keep doing it. Or dude, this is totally awesome, let's do shit together. That's what it's really all about. And that's, that's, that's why the band is such a like integral part of rock and roll. It's not about just like, one dude on his own, it's not like this guy and some guy standing behind him. It's about a group of friends getting together and doing something as a team. 
Um, and then contrary to that, there we also have unjust, oppressive, stagnant, or decaying societies. And I think you can see that pretty clearly in places like, uh, like London in the 1970s, and New York in the 1970s, and Washington DC in the 80s. Um, the more shitty and oppressive and falling apart and crap societies are, the more awesome the countercultures that grow under them tend to be. Um, people have something amazing to push, I mean, people have something shitty to push against to create something amazing in the process. Um, so those are our elements, right? Um, power, Captain Planet is formed. There's a regular guy. Good news, everyone. Good news, everyone. It's contagious. Um, once people start doing this stuff, other people pay attention. Most people are like, this is terrible, it's a lot of noise, it's just a lot of screaming, I hate this so much, what's wrong with kids today? But a couple other people are like, this is totally great, where do I get a guitar? Can I join your band? Can we do this together? Let's put shows on. Um, can you be in my zine? And it's great, it's on and on and on like that. Um, and so in doing this, people have what I would like to call rock and roll weapons, and there's a bunch of them. And I could talk about all this for ages, but I've identified three today. Um, the first one's the amplifier. Back in the day, if you were into music and you wanted to use music to, to move people to tears or to make people's heart feel like they want to explode off their chest, you would need an orchestra. You would need to be really well connected or really wealthy or at the very least like a total crazy child genius prodigy to get into a position where you could actually write music for this orchestra and put it out there. You could be a part of that orchestra, but to be able to take something from your own voice without validation from like a ton of other people, it was pretty much impossible. You had to be the one writing the music, everyone else had to do what you say, and in the process a lot of other people had to put their stamp of approval on what you were doing. Um, with the advent of the amplifier, that completely tears that apart. It suddenly says that one guy with one idea, he doesn't need to be rich, he doesn't need to be well connected, he doesn't even need to be that smart or talented, but he just needs to have a ton of heart and passion. He can make as much noise as any orchestra, he can hit you harder than they ever did. Um, and that's really pretty, pretty awesome to me. Um, so next up, we have the tape. Um, the advent of tape technology, whether it's cassettes or four track reel to reel, allow kids to turn their bedrooms into recording studios and their parents' lodges into their own little record labels. It allow kids to record their own music, put it in the post, send it off to someone on the other end of the world, and share their ideas with people without needing any sort of like outside backing or approval from any sort of industry. It's kind of a paradox that like all of this like 50s, 60s, and you know, well into the 70s rock and roll music was still part of some bigger corporate industry. There were guys in suits sitting there printing all these Beatles, Beatles records. There were guys in suits putting Elvis Presley on TV. It didn't happen by accident. And um, in, in, in part, that shaped what it would be. It, it started telling this narrative that the artists themselves weren't necessarily in control of. Um, the advent of tape and the birth of indie rock kind of like, you know, totally tore that apart. Um, and then lastly, non-sonic media. This is difficult to to summarize quickly, but there's a whole lot of other amazing shit that revolves around being a band and making rock and roll music that has nothing to do with music. Um, stuff like album art, or the way that bands would present themselves, the way that they would dress up. Um, music videos, or even not making music videos. A band like Fugazi who refused to make music videos in like the heights of MTV madness. Not making that music video was a huge statement, and for me that's massively exciting. Um, and this is really one of the like avenues of rock and roll that I'm most excited about, beyond just the music. Um, but uh, so I've made this interesting little chart. It's highly scientific. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can see it's, it's, there's quantified fun factor there, which is like you know the, the actual impact on society, how much it rocked the boat, how much it freaked people out, and how exciting it was. Um, and then there's time. So starting in the 19 what? Oh wait. Sorry, rock and roll weapons. Okay, so starting with rock and roll in the 1950s, you can see there's this kind of like spike of the birth of rock and roll. It kind of dies off once Elvis gets sent to the army and once uh, Little Richard quits and once Buddy Holly dies. It picks up again in the 60s in the UK once like kids started playing all those band records um, with the Beatles and the Stones and the Yardbirds and stuff. Um, and then slowly over time it becomes less and less significant and less and less dangerous because it just becomes the music of people's parents. Um, and I, I mean, I think all of that, a lot of that music is totally great, but it's not dangerous, it's not challenging anyone. Back in the day, just simply playing a guitar was like an act of rebellion and free people the fuck out. Having shaggy hair was this like crazy thing, but eventually it's like, well, that's what my dad looked like, that's what my granddad looked like. 
Um, and, and this is natural. And, and I kind of like seeing a similar thing with most genres. It's the same thing with Surf Rock. You know, starting out with Dick Dale, crazy and awesome as little hell, challenging everything, drops down. There's some little like revival there somewhere in the 90s with Man or Man. Somewhere around 2010 is the drums and best post. Um, it's really nice, pleasant music and it's great, but it's not freaking anyone out. Whereas like 1961, seeing Dick Dale playing guitar, people are like, what the fuck is this? My brain is going to explode. Um, so then we've got Punk Rock itself as well, which is a lot more ups and downs. It seems to kind of kill itself and keep pushing itself forward. Um, uh, so basically what I'm getting at is that like slowly over time, this rock and roll spirit becomes diluted and that's natural. And in a way, it will keep challenging itself and pushing itself forward, which is why after punk rock you have post-punk, why after rock and roll, aggressive rock, then you have post-rock, and on and on and on. And, you know, people keep kind of like challenging stuff, but at the same time, the danger and challenge of that becomes less and less and less. So where we're sitting at now, is, you know, it's 2015, this has been happening a lot, we've seen people do a lot of interesting stuff, people have put pushed music to be as loud as it can be, as distorted as it can be, as electronic as it can be, um, and now punk is dead. <laughs> Luckily, we have games. Um, so, uh, I've long had this idea that like games are the next punk rock, um, the next rock and roll, and it's something I haven't really been able to articulate to people necessarily or explain that well. But it's something that like here and now I can see as being like very, very true. Like fast forward a couple of years and it's really happening. Um, I will put a brief note here that punk rock oh, well, well, games do have a huge punk heritage. Um, that like the act of making games has from like the very beginning been something of a rebellious act because it was using technology that wasn't intended for, you know, the playing of games. Um, and there's also been a lot of really interesting people over time being, you know, really disruptive in the way that they've made games. Um, I'll mention Ed as a pretty good example. But at the same time, Ed were also guys who were privileged. They were in a position where they were able to make the games that they made. Um, and although they had to kind of like screw the system a bit to do it, they were still like, you know, well-educated, well off well privileged white guys. Um, and games haven't been open to everyone. It's been really hard. You need a lot of money behind you. You need a lot of knowledge. You need a lot of equipment. Um, and so it's not the same as a kid being able to pick the guitar and be like, I can play three chords, I can start a band now. Um, but luckily, that's what we changed it. Um, which leads me on to point three. Punk! Yay. Um, <laughs> this shit is happening now, and it's happening at a huge, exciting, massive level. There is so much awesome shit going on that I can speak for 20 minutes easily about the different twine games that people are making about weird shit that people are doing and sharing with each other on itch.io. It's just, it's overwhelming and so beautiful to see. But what I'm most interested in is where are we going with this? Uh, once people really recognize what it is that they're doing, how much further can we push this and what are these games going to be like? So to quickly look at like where we're at, while we have rock and roll weapons, what are our punk game weapons? I would argue that Unity is our amplifier. Unity, a lot, like it, the, the, the relationship between someone working with Unity uh, is the same as relative to, to the analogy of the orchestra. You no longer need tons of people, tons of money, tons of you know, backing and support. As a small group of people, even one person, if you have the time and energy and passion, you can make something that looks incredibly beautiful and amazing and has a like, real impact on people. Um, the internet is our tape visit. Um, there are so many fantastic platforms and there's just more and more all the time that are allowing people to share their games without any need for outside approval in much the same way that cassette tapes allow any rock to be born in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then non-game media, this is a more difficult one to kind of like pin down. Um, one of the things that I point towards is the rise of custom controllers and stuff that change your experience in playing the game well beyond the confines of the screen. Um, and then there's also the side of it of how do you handle the business of, of making and releasing games. Um, for me, Flambeer is a really beautiful example of a, of a company that's punk as fuck, not just in terms of the games that they're making, but in terms of how they handle being a company making games. Um, as an example, whenever everything goes on sale at Steam, whether it's Christmas or Black Friday or whatever, the Flambeer, you know, uh, Nuclear Throne is still the same price. They're like, this is what this game's worth. It being Christmas doesn't change what this game's worth. And it's an insult to the people who paid what it's worth to suddenly be giving it away for next to nothing. But what they did do, that's totally awesome, is at Christmas last year, every single person who bought UK Throne was given a code to give it to a friend. 
they gave away thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of their game um, as a token, as a gesture back to the people who supported them. And that, for me, is pretty much quite this far. Um, so now we get on to what I really wanted to talk about, which is the shape of punk to come. So I've quickly summarized seven points that I think uh, punk games in the future will embody. Uh, the first one, fast, loud, and short. This is pretty much the MO for writing punk rock songs. Um, it's pretty much like totally swimming against the stream of saying like you need some sort of double disc album or some two hour symphony to have an impact on people. It's saying, fuck that, give me a minute and a half, one side of a record and I'm done. Um, and uh, I'm very excited to see games follow a similar, a similar function. Just by making a game short, that is probably one of the most rebellious design, design decisions that you can make because people place so much value on the length of the game and you can see that on comments on pretty much every game on Steam. This is too long. I only played it for 300 hours. I hate this game. It's a piece of crap. If you make a game short, that's a huge slap in the face to everyone who thinks that the value of a game is embedded in how long it is, because um, that's garbage. Um, two, unconventional and unfamiliar twists. Very early on, games have sort of fallen into a space where it's we have these genres, we have these certain, certain mechanics that fit together, and people immediately understand them and they're like, cool, I'm playing a platformer. Or I'm playing first person shooter or whatever it is. Nowadays, we're living in a time where you see a lot of hybrid stuff between existing genres. So it's a roguelike shoot em up or it's a strategy RPG. It's simply taking understandable building blocks and putting them back together. And that's great. And there's a lot of really cool games that do this. But what I'm very enthusiastic to see is games that completely shatter that entirely, where people have no idea where they fit in or what they even are. Um, three, willfully broken. Probably the biggest insult anyone can give any game is that the game is broken. Games can be ugly, boring, uh, they can have poor level design or any number of problems, but people will be willing to look past that. But if a game's broken, people are like, this is broken, I'm not playing it. Um, personally, I don't have a very high threshold for games that are like difficult to get into or ugly looking, but I can really respect people who kind of embrace glitchiness, bugs, randomness, all the chaos that comes into programming a game that people spend hours upon hours upon hours trying to polish out. Part of that is the humanity of the game. That's the real human spirit, but we try to like brush it aside in this like endless attempt at perfection. And um, I think seeing broken games in the future is definitely going to be a pretty exciting thing. Screw getting paid. Sorry Dave. <laughs> We've got two totally contradictory things going here. And I want to clarify that I'm not saying screw getting paid at all, and I'm definitely not saying like starve and die in the streets. You can get paid doing whatever you like, but if you're making punk rock games, your concern shouldn't be money. Your concern shouldn't be appeasing people, trying to appeal to people to give you their money, trying to you know get on the good sides of critics or YouTubers. Um, you should be caring about doing what you want to do and maybe what your friends would like to see. Um, and if you know, if you've got all these other concerns, what you're doing, it pretty much stops being a fun thing and it starts becoming a commercial enterprise. And that's totally great. And there are a freaking ton of games that I absolutely adore that, you know, are just that. But um, I think it would be pretty exciting to see people making games like this purely for the love of it. This is a debate that's raged through music for particularly the last 15 years, and it's a debate I've had with a lot of my friends who wanted to kind of go pro or make it, or like, you know, kind of make a living out of being in a band. And perhaps this is just my friends, but I've not seen any output that's improved in terms of quantity or quality from anyone who's attempted to make it. Uh, generally, it's just the opposite. And on the flip side, out there in the Park somewhere, well, actually, over in the States right now somewhere, there's a band called The Makeovers. They're from Kilda Park in Pretoria. They've been together for about four years. They've just released their eighth album. They record and produce their own music. They do their own album art. They release themselves on their own label, Cringy Records. On top of that, they make all kinds of merch, clothing, badges, comic books, zines, custom-made toys. They are by far the most prolific and creative individuals I know, and they both do that while working jobs. Um, and so this idea that you need to, you know, get paid for doing what you do, that's not true. You can do a lot of other things and still, still make games on the side, and you can make totally amazing, awesome shit. Um, number five, radical new voices. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about this, and I don't even really feel like I need to say too much about it myself, but like, the voice of gaming has pretty much forever been this, like, 
pretty boring, pale male perspective on the world. Um, and part of that has been in that those pale males have been privileged enough to be in positions to make it. Um, with those walls being torn down, we're going to see a lot more games coming out that represent different voices, and I'm incredibly happy to see that. A lot of my favorite bands have been exactly that, from Jimi Hendrix through to the Tigra. Um, and I think it's going to be really pretty fantastic to see that. And uh, yeah, that's really one of the things to get most excited about. Um, number six, kind of compassionate. This is one of the ones that I'm mega, mega, mega excited about as well. In part of rock and roll, kind of intermingling so deeply with like with corporate media, with the powers that be, there's been this narrative that's been told on and on and on about the douchey asshole rock star. Um, and it kind of starts with like, you know, this like James Dean, too cool for school um, kind of thing, leading up to, you know, Sid Vicious, dripping with blood, sneering at the crowd, spitting at them. Um, and, and, and the sad thing is that these, these like icons are put out there for people and then kids imitate them thinking that's what's cool. And I've seen this play out time and time and time again at punk shows with kids smashing bottles, with little locks around their necks and their hair spiked up, being total assholes to each other because they think that makes them cool. I've never met anyone like that in Portland, cool. never ever. The people that I think are cool are kind, compassionate, warm, good people. And I think those are the kind of people that should be cool going forward in this next wave of punk because that's going to only lead to more kindness and compassion and that's really what rock and roll should be about. It's about pushing us forward, not pulling us backwards. Um, and lastly, that leads me on to number seven. There are no fucking rules, dude. <laughs> That's a, a song by a band called Chick 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 from the early 2000s. They, at that time, combined disco and punk rock in a really, really interesting, dangerous, exciting cocktail of stuff. Um, in the time subsequent, it's kind of, you know, being uh, emulated a lot or kind of like watered down. But at that time, it really blew me away. And, and the, the, the title still sticks with me. There are no rules to this shit. Um, it's definitely not up to me or anyone else to define or dictate what punk game should be. Um, the point is constantly swimming against whatever is becoming the norm and continuing to challenge that. Um, so, with that, I bid you all adieu. I would be very excited to see what everyone in this room is going to make. There are my details if anyone wants to reach out to me. Thank you all very much for listening to me.